Hello, I'm Tom Stapledon, and I've got a talk for you today on behalf of the Friends of Williamson's Tunnels. Um, some of you will know that all of my talks up to now have been about Joseph Williamson and his tunnels in Edge Hill in Liverpool, uh, but this one's going to be a slight departure. This one's going to be about the Edge Hill to Lime Street railway cutting and how it uh, crosses over with Joseph Williamson. Um, we have a couple of uh, really, to my mind, very interesting historical bits of information that have come our way over the years through our uh, wonderful researchers. And um, one of them concerns um, a lovely set of photographs from the 1880s. And the other one is a piece of writing which crosses over in exactly the same time period. And they both interact with the story of Joseph Williamson and his land and, um, <clears throat> and his tunnels. So uh, I am by no means an expert on railways or even this particular railway, the Liverpool and Manchester. <clears throat> but this story is quite close to our hearts, those of us who are much involved with the Williamson tunnels, because this railway cuts right through the middle of Williamson's land and through one of his major tunnels. Uh, and so we, we find it an interesting subject. So I'm going to tell you a bit about this. and. Uh, uh, apologies to any uh, real railway experts who know more than I do. I may make some mistakes, but hopefully they won't be too drastic. The general facts hopefully will be fairly accurate. So please bear with me. It all starts here with this gentleman. This is George Stevenson, known to many people as the father of the railways. George Stevenson was the man who uh, started off as a railway locomotive engineer started building small scale railways, mostly industrial. Um, but the first passenger railway in the world was the one that he uh, designed, had constructed and saw opened up here um, in uh, Liverpool. And um, this was the first proper passenger railway in the world. Some people do seem to dispute it, but uh, this was it. Um, this was the first railway to use steam locomotives to haul its trains from the word go when it opened in uh, 1830. It was the first one to employ automatic signaling from the word go. It was the first one to have um, a proper published timetable from the word go. So, and it was the first one to connect two major cities together as a passenger railway system. So that makes it the first proper passenger railway in the world, as far as I'm concerned. This uh, lovely drawing, um, I think, may be fairly accurate depiction of uh, what the early railway was like. I couldn't tell you what engine this is or where this um, picture is, uh, is drawn, but it gives you an idea of the, uh, the basic railway of the early days, uh, 1830 onwards. Uh, two or three carriages here, probably based on stagecoaches big enough to hold four or six passengers um, enclosed, so reasonably comfortable compared to the poor people traveling in first class behind who were in oaken carriages, which really are nothing more than cattle trucks with seats in them. Not much fun for anybody in those days traveling on the early railways, uh, rattling along between these two cities. In fact, uh, most people of the day were terrified of these great smoking machines and thought that if you traveled at more than 10 miles an hour, you wouldn't be able to breathe. But anyway, there was a lot of excitement about them. They very soon caught on and people were prepared to travel in them. Can't think what it must have been like in the open carriages. Or for the driver and fireman on the footplate, it must have been uh, awful. This is um, a poster of the day, uh, which gives a lot of useful information. I'm not going to try and read it all. There's just too much information given there. It would be lovely to read it all. But it seems that uh, when the... Um, railway opened, the passenger terminus was at Crown Street. Um, the main yard was at Edge Hill. Um, and this was too far away from the city. So during 1829, they drove a short tunnel through from Edge Hill station down to Crown Street, or oh, sorry, rather it was up to Crown Street. For some reason, it's a slight uphill gradient to Crown Street. And the locomotives of the day, not having very much power at all, could barely pull themselves, 
never mind a set of coaches, they uh, were not capable of pulling up the gradient with, uh, with a train behind. So they used steam, locom uh, not locomotives, steam engines at Crown Street and rope hauled the carriages up to the station there. And then they came back down to Edge Hill by gravity, were reconnected to a locomotive and on their way to uh, Manchester. Bit unsatisfactory, but it worked and the passengers were enjoying it. But of course, it was much too far away from the city. So they had what we would call today a, um, a coach transfer system. Um, Horse-drawn carriages would leave Dale Street, I believe, and uh, taking a, a variety of different routes um, and different pickup and drop-off points, they would go up to Crown Street to uh, connect the passengers between the city centre and the Crown Street station. And um, trains for first class passengers and second class passengers were separated. Uh, one lot left on the hour, the other lot left on the half hour, so that the, the gentry wouldn't have to uh, mix and stand alongside the hoi polloi. <laughs> I believe if you wanted um, to be in a carriage with um, only four passengers, you paid a shilling more than if you were in a carriage that held six passengers. Presumably, it was a bit more cramped in a carriage that held six. But all sorts of inf interesting information here. This um, train service ran um, seven days a week, uh, less on Sundays, I think. But uh, this was really quite a, a nice piece of writing. It's a shame there isn't time to read it all. Uh, anyway, we must move on from there. And it was very soon found that this um, passenger terminus at Crown Street was just not satisfactory. The 1829 tunnel was only a single track, so not many trains could pass up and down um, the railway between Edge Hill and Crown Street. The railway was becoming more popular minute by minute. So by 1833, there were already plans afoot for a new station to be uh, constructed down at Lime Street. And that involved driving a tunnel through from Edge Hill over a mile, 1.1 mile long, between Edge Hill and Lime Street. This was a major, major undertaking, but it was built between 1833 and 1836. And again, that was quite a steep gradient, one in 90 or thereabouts, which doesn't sound much if you're a car driver, but um, the locomotives of the day just couldn't cope with that. So for many years, up until uh, somewhere around 1860, probably, the trains were lowered down to Lime Street um, on uh, an endless rope, which I believe was made of hemp. And then they were drawn back up again to Edge Hill by steam engines. Um, it worked and everybody was happy. Uh, but of course, it, um, it took a bit of extra time to uncouple trains from the locomotives and then couple them on again. And um, this went on for quite some time uh, while the railway was becoming more and more popular. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway by this time had been absorbed into a bigger uh, organisation, became the London and North Western Railway. Um, and the network was starting to crisscross the country uh, in, in very few years over the 1830s, 40s, 50s, we, we had a, a network of railways covering the whole country and more and more passengers wanting to travel. By uh, 1870, uh, I believe the locomotives were powerful enough that they could take their trains down to Lime Street and pull them back up the gradient again. That was a, a big improvement. So um, locomotive hauling started down to Lime Street, I think about 1870. But that immediately brought in a new problem. Up to 24, uh, 24 trains an hour, I believe, were trying to use this, um, this service between Edge Hill and Lime Street on two tracks of rails. And it must have been absolutely unbearably smoky, uh, full of smoke, steam and soot inside this tunnel. And what you're looking at there in that picture is the answer to that problem. Um, a man called James, John Ramsbottom was the chief mechanical engineer for the London and Northwestern Railway. 
And it was he who designed an enormous great fan driven by a steam engine, which was built into a large cavern built alongside the railway tunnel, which was anywhere from 60 to 80 feet below ground level where it passes this spot. This, by the way, is Smithdown Lane. The railway is running diagonally across Smithdown Lane, roughly where these people are standing on the pavement, running down to Lime Street. And those flats were still there until uh, maybe about three or four years ago when they were demolished. And Ramsbottom's chimney was built up from a, a level of the uh, track bed of the tunnel. And this enormous cavern cut out of the rock contained a large fan and the steam engine that drove it. And then this chimney was built up above there. I can't tell you how high this chimney is above ground level, but I believe it was, where's my notes? It was 198 feet tall from track level. So uh, if we assume that it was at least 60 feet below ground level, that's an awful lot of chimney above ground as well. So um, this worked well. It cleared the smoke very nicely at busy times. Uh, it probably just sat there idling when there weren't many trains, but when it was at its busiest, it would have been running nonstop probably. And this was built, I think, in uh, 1870 to coincide with the starting of um, steam hall trains going down to uh, Lime Street. Now, um, <laughs> plans were already afoot to move on at this time because the two two lane tunnel was not coping with the amount of traffic wanting to use um, Lime Street Station. And so the plans were to open up the railway tunnel into a four lane cutting. Now this is where uh, I bring in the first of my uh, little stories. I want to show you a set of photographs. And these photographs date from 1880 to 1885. And this is the time when the Edge Hill cutting was being opened up above the original 1830s railway tunnel. This was a massive undertaking. And if, in fact, it was, it was driven right through Williamson's triple decker tunnel on his land. Um, the, the 1830s tunnel constructed 1833 to 1836 went right through the base of his triple decker tunnel. And um, the navvies working for the railway company got a terrible shock when they cut through, I believe, the way the story is written. Uh, and realized they were in somebody else's tunnel. Um, but this, of course, was um, 50 years later, and they knew all about what were lay below at this point. But they drove their railway um, cutting, or they excavated their railway cutting, directly down above the original tunnel and alongside it. Now, this set of photos, I believe, are uh, in... Um, British Railways uh, Museum archive in, uh, in Crewe. And they were discovered uh, some years ago, um, but I discovered them myself from uh, the writings of a rather interesting lady uh, who wrote a blog about uh, this particular um, bit of history, the, the cutting of the railway cutting through Edge Hill. She was a very interesting woman and she was interested in all sorts of subjects and she traveled the world and she wrote about what she saw. And I came across her blog with this lovely set of um, something like 20 photographs all taken in the 1880s, uh, recording the, the progress of the, um, the work in cutting out this uh, cutting. And uh, she, she wrote um, what, she, what she thought was the best explanation of what she thought she was looking at in these photographs, and I agreed with most of what she wrote. I had uh, one or two quibbles with some things, but uh, uh, we, we may never know exactly who's right and who's wrong, and it doesn't matter. But um, I thought this was a wonderful set of photographs. And we, we start off in, starting off with this one. Um, and because Liverpool City Council, or its predecessor, whatever they were called, um, made a rule absolutely Bad the, forbade the railway from removing any roads. It meant that they had to cut bridges 
underneath every road they crossed. And there were many, many roads between Edge Hill and Lime Street that had to be crossed with this uh, railway cutting. So what you'll see in these pictures are masses of bridges spanning over the top of the cutting, each one carrying a road that crossed over at that point. In this one, they haven't gone down very far. You can see that there will be the level of the roadway above, whichever road this is they're crossing, and that will be the wall above the pavement. And what they did was to undermine the rock. Remember, we're going through solid sandstone rock here all the way. Uh, they will have undermined the rock here, leaving rock above. They faced it with stone blocks, of course, um, but not knowing how, how strong the rock would be, or what the quality of the rock was, they couldn't take chances. So every one of these bridges has been lined. This, I think you'll find, is about seven rows of brick. So this brick arch is holding up the sandstone above, making doubly sure that nothing's going to collapse. And they start off by doing this, and then they'll carry on digging down and down and down. It could be anything from 60, 70, 80. I believe it was even 90 feet deep at, uh, at one spot where this uh, cutting goes down through Edge Hill. Lots of nabbies working there. And uh, here's another nice shot. This, this intrigues me. Um, it seems to me that every time they knew the photographer was coming down to record the scene, all the bosses came out in force all standing there in their frock coats and their bowler hats, this one even with his furled umbrella. They didn't want to be missed out when the photographer was around by the look of it. Photography was quite in its infancy in these days, really. I mean, there was no such photography as this by 1840 when Williamson died. 40 years later, uh, photography has come a long way. Uh, I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, photographic system was used here, but it's absolutely superb in its quality for the day. And uh, as you see, these bosses came out in force. They, uh, they, they all wanted to be in on the picture. Two men there working uh, a derrick type crane, handle on either side, winding it around. Um, gentleman here just about to cross on this plank. Nobody cared about health and safety matters at that time. Don't know how far he is above the, the uh, temporary rail track. So this temporary rail track would have been put in uh, in, in an area that they excavated. Uh, and uh, stone would have been loaded in uh, and carted away that way. Uh, the original tunnel is probably somewhere underneath this massive rock. You'll see this over and over again as they've gone down stage by stage. Now, at this point, they're digging down on the right-hand side to a lower level, but they haven't put the rails in there yet. The temporary rails are still on the top. You can see they're getting down quite a long way into the cutting. This one you should recognize, of course, because we've just been looking at it, Ramsbottom's chimney. So uh, on this picture, I can tell you quite definitely that Ramsbottom's chimney is on the southerly side of the railway cutting. Uh, and so we're looking down towards Lime Street. And this is the bridge that carries Smith down Lane over the cutting. Uh, they seem to have rails in the lower level there and cutting out stone on this upper level here. There's a lot going on in there, isn't there? Uh, cutting down at this point, temporary rail lines on the top. There's a steam locomotive and a set of trucks. They'd be loading masses of stone blocks out of here and the small stuff that um, isn't any use except for some kind of infill. And look at that thing up on top there. There's a, a gantry arrangement with a steam crane sitting on top of it, which can be moved across from one side to the other. Uh, you've just got to hope that the engineer who, uh, who designed this had done his calculations right, and he knew that uh, this, this gantry was um, strong enough built to withstand the weight of that steam crane and anything it might be lifting out of there. Otherwise, there could have been a terrible accident. Now then, look at that. Uh, we've gone down on this side to quite a depth. Uh, the temporary rail line's been put in for removing the stone. And there's this massive stone there still sitting, quite possibly right above the railway tunnel. And I can tell you that all the time this was going on, right up until nearly the end, the railway carried on running trains through the tunnel that lay beneath all this lot. In the background there, you can see, we'll see some closer shots later. That's a wooden chute, which was used for um, sending the small stuff, presumably, down into waiting rail trucks uh, on the lower level below. Look at this man on his ladder. 
they seem to have enormous great ladders. None of your uh, two and three stage lightweight aluminium ladders in those days would have taken several men to lift a ladder like that up. And they didn't care much about health and safety matters either. You can just imagine today, this man would have had to have perhaps uh, gone through an induction and uh, be made to wear a hard hat. And uh, there would have been a man made to foot the ladder at the bottom. Otherwise, there'd be no possibility of anybody being allowed to climb a ladder. So I wonder anything gets done today. But uh, they didn't care in those days. They just got on with it. And uh, you can see a little bit clearer, perhaps, that uh, that shoot up there, sending the uh, small stuff down. And there seems to be railway trucks there at the far end. Look at this man standing up here. They didn't have any fear of heights at all. And just check this one out. I think this is a lovely shot. Just look at that man standing on the edge there and another one lower down. There's probably about at least a 60 foot drop below him down to the uh, down to the track bed. But uh, they don't seem to be bothered at all. <laughs> this is uh, this is interesting. Um, when Jan Ford was writing um, her description of every one of these shots as uh, as you went through her her write up, she had quite a bit to say about some of them where she could tell what was actually going on. But when it came to this shot, she said very little. In fact, she wrote something like, an interesting picture, but what is it? And as soon as I saw this shot, I laughed because I knew exactly what it was. This is our photograph, the one and only photograph that we know to exist of the open mouth of Williamson's Great Tunnel. It was taken by a... Um, quite famous photographer called James Mudd in 1881. And we found this, one of our researchers found this in the York Railway Museum, I believe. And for some reason, it's in this batch of photos of the works at the railway cutting. And yet it's several hundred yards away from the railway cutting. And in fact, absolutely nothing to do with it. So you've got to wonder how it got in there. To be honest, now I'm also wondering, the, I've just recently looked at this set of photographs in the archives again, and they're all listed as having been taken in 1881. And we know that this was taken in 1881, or we're told that it was taken in 1881. I'm now starting to wonder whether this whole set of photographs might have been taken by James Mudd. Maybe he was a photographer who was commissioned to record the progress of the railway cutting works for the London and North Western Railway. And maybe one day he wandered over onto Joseph Williamson's land because he'd heard about the tunnels and took this photograph while he was about it. I really don't believe they were all taken in 1881 because you can see that some of them are at a much earlier stage of the excavations and some of them are at a much later stage when it's nearly completed in 1885. But they've all been labelled as 1881 for some reason. Anyway, we'll never know whether James Mudd took all of these photographs or not, but it's a possibility, I think. Um, this one is further up the line. I think this is taken fairly close to Edge Hill Station. Again, the bosses are there. Frock coats, bowler hats, definitely want to be in on the photo. This, I think, is a section of the original tunnel, the two-track tunnel. And at this point, they've uh, made the decision to build a single track a uh, smaller tunnel on either side. So we can only see the one on the right-hand side here. There would be another one over there out of the picture. Uh, but they all come together very shortly uh, beyond this point and um, merge into the cutting, which is about 55 feet wide, I believe, most places down the line. Uh, you've already seen something almost identical to this shot, but... Uh, the reason I've put it in is because it seems to have been slightly wider angle or taken from slightly further back. I think it's taken from the bridge over Mason Street, which is closest to us. And of course, you're looking down at the Smith, uh, Smith Down Lane Bridge. But the interesting thing for me is you've got the cutting wall here. And above it, I believe, is one of Williamson's buildings, one of Williamson's houses. And it would have been number 52. Now, I know that the London and North Western Railway bought up a mass of land uh, above where the railway cutting was going and on both sides of it for the purposes of doing all this work. 
um, it, it was compulsory purchased uh, as part of the process. They will have knocked some buildings down. I think there would have been a Williamson building above here and more on the left. I rather think that this was one of Williamson's buildings that survived, didn't need to be knocked down in the process. Uh, either that or they've demolished his building and they put another building up long before they finished constructing the uh, cutting, which seems so unlikely. So I think this is the side wall of one of Williamson's houses, and I think it would have been number 52 on Mason Street. Uh, that's a nice shot, isn't it? That's a closer view of uh, one of these chutes sending the, uh, the small stuff down into the waiting railway trucks and uh, a lot of work going on there of cutting uh, all this rock out. Now, um, I should have mentioned earlier another interesting uh, connection. Um, I nearly forgot about it altogether. But there was a, a lovely piece of writing, uh, which, uh, again, our uh, researchers discovered. And this piece, uh, of all places, was found in the, the journal for 1883, of the North Staffordshire Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers. And this comes about because on the 4th of December, 1882, members from the society paid a field trip to Liverpool. Uh, they came for two reasons. They came to inspect the works here in the railway cutting. And then in the afternoon, they went off to inspect the uh, newly opened dock system, the, uh, the North Docks, which were expanding madly at the same time. Now, it's a lovely bit of Victorian writing. It's written up by the, um, the secretary of the North Staff's Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers, um, whether he, I presume he was on this, on this visit. And he describes how uh, on the morning of Monday, the 4th of December, 1882, at 8.30 in the morning, a group of excursionists, lovely word, um, boarded a train at Stoke-on-Trent and they arrived at Edge Hill Station at 10.30. And there they were met by a Mr. Henry A. Dibbon, who was the engineer in, the, in charge of these operations for the London and Northwestern Railway Company. And he met them and he was going to escort them to uh, have a guided tour of the works and to have explanations of what was going on and how it was being done. And um, uh, he's written that um, the excursion of the excursionists, there was a fair muster, <laughs> a nice word. It doesn't explain how many a fair muster is. It could be 10, 20, 50, who knows? But anyway, a group of them came up on a jolly and they were escorted around these works. And uh, there were a number of interesting facts that came out um, in this little bit of writing. Um, first of all, um, we're told that uh, Mr. Dibbon told them that during the process of opening out this railway cutting, no less than 400,000 cubic yards of stone were to be removed. 400,000 cubic yards. That's quite a lot. And um, a lot of the stone was being got out uh, in, in, uh, by the quarrying methods. Uh, with the intention of it being used. They had uh, use for all the good stone that they could get out of here uh, in their own workings, uh, tunnels, bridges, embankments, railway walls, buildings, you name it, they had a use for it. And if there was any more than they could use up for, make use of at any time, um, it was also being used for uh, building the docks. Um, docks and dock buildings, no doubt. So there was plenty of use for this stone. Of course, they did lead to um, blast the stone at times. And whenever it was necessary to use blasting, um, the decision was made to use the what they called the milder black powder. Uh, I'm sure that things like dynamite and gelignite had been um, developed at that time, but they were uh, a more powerful kind of explosive. And because of the proximity of um, people and buildings all around these works, um, they probably didn't want to uh, risk big lumps of stone flying around and injuring people. And uh, as well as that, it would have been much more likely that the mild black powder would break off great chunks of stone into usable blocks, um, doing less damage and creating less small crumbly stuff that was no use except for infill. 
So uh, interesting facts like this came out. And um, while they were here, they were also shown over Joseph Williamson's workings. Mr. Dibbin would have known all about Joseph Williamson's um, tunnels right next door from the earlier experiences in the 1830s, uh, boring through his tunnel. And I think he would have been um, very much uh, in contact with the Territorial Army who were occupying a lot of these sites uh, over the top of Williamson's uh, tunnels. And he probably got a map or a plan from the Territorials. And this plan, or a, a cleaned up version of it, was published in the journal of the North Staffs Institute, along with this uh, write-up of their visit. So all very interesting stuff. And in fact, they were, they were shown inside Williamson's Great Tunnel, and it was explained to them how the, the territorials were using it as a drill shed. So we know that that tr story is very, very true. And we know that in that time, 1882, Williamson's Great Tunnel was in existence and it was being used by the, the army as a, as a drill shed. So that's all very, very useful information to us. Proves that it wasn't all lies or a, a joke. Now then, there's an interesting set of photographs here. We've got right down to the track bed of the original two-track tunnel. And this is it. Brick lining of a tunnel that had been driven through the rock 60, 70, 80 feet below ground. They've now cut out all the stone right down to the top of this tunnel uh, and alongside it, where they're now constructing a new uh, tunnel alongside. And this one is just about to be demolished. These gentlemen here are all waiting to get at it. In the next picture, you'll see that they've got pickaxes and they're knocking chunks out of the side wall of this tunnel, leaving just little narrow strips in between. And you can see what's going to happen next. When the shore all's clear, nobody's in the way, they're all going to do the final few taps, knock the last few bricks out, and down she goes. There's the whole tunnel collapsed into the uh, on top of the railway lines. Uh, a lot of strength in it, obviously. It's still there on the curve. That's got to be uh, knocked down as well. And then it's all got to be carted away. And then this great mass of stone in the middle will be uh, hacked away later. It's amazing the way this was done. Um, again, this is the, uh, the original track. This is the newly cut half. We're looking down towards Lime Street. And uh, they're still nibbling away here at the brick lining of the tunnel. And we move in a bit closer. Oh no, this one's further up the line again. They do jump around all over the place. This one's um, further up towards Edge Hill, again, where you've got the original two track tunnel and they built a little single track either side. And just beyond this point, they'll come together into the, uh, the main cutting. Uh, back to these, this is, this is rather interesting. It would seem to me that they, they really wanted to keep the trains running for as long as they possibly could uh, before this um, excavation work finally caused them to uh, shut the lines and probably lay on um, what would become a, um, a temporary um, <laughs> rail replacement service using, using um, stagecoaches again to take passengers from Edge Hill down to Lime Street and back. Uh, but that no doubt they would have wanted to uh, keep that down to an absolute minimum and keep the trains running for as long as they possibly could. So I think here what's happening is that they've constructed a wooden structure inside the original brick arch tunnel to protect it. And then they're chipping away at the brickwork above a little bit at a time going down the line or up the line, whichever direction it is. Uh, no, this is, this is looking up towards, um, towards uh, Edge Hill. In the next one, you can see it more closely. It is definitely wooden lined structure, must be plywood. I didn't know they had it in the 1880s, but it must be. And uh, that's protecting the rail line so that the trains could still keep running for as much of the time as possible while this was going on. And then in the background, you can see the brick arch of the tunnel still intact, probably being nibbled away a little bit at a time as they go. And there we're, uh, we're, we're definitely right down to the bottom level two original lines of tracks, 
and then this mass of rock has just got to be cut out and then the uh, the other pair of lines will be uh, put in and then we can open it out into a four lane cutting look at the number of bridges there one two three bridges in a row and then a short tunnel and uh, in fact in the next one i think it's one two three there, there are four bridges um i think the only area where there are, where there are four roads crossing the um the line of the cutting so close together it's, it's quite close to tunnel road uh, in edge hill i think uh, i'm not quite sure but i i have uh, thought i identified where this spot must be on the google uh, satellite view I, i'm not sure whether i'm right or not but this is getting quite close to the end all that mass of rock has been cut out and the rail line there is probably a temporary one taking away the uh, the remains of the debris and the rock that's being cut out and this is the original two lines that went through the tunnel so not far away from finishing so this this shot must be uh, probably in 1885 i think uh, it opened up as a four lane cutting in 1885 and again from that point of view uh, from that point onwards of course uh, ramsbottom chimney was no longer required it was built in 1870 about the time when they first started hauling trains down to Lime Street by, uh, by locomotive. Um, and it worked uh, quite efficiently, I believe, from 1870 right up to 1885. But then it became obsolete overnight when this cutting was opened out. Uh, but the funny thing is that Ramsbottom's chimney remained there until about 1970. I don't know why it stayed there so long. It only had a useful working life of 15 years. Um, strange, but there you go. Uh, this, this last shot has got nothing to do with that set of photos, um, but I thought it was quite an interesting one. I think this one dates from sometime in the 80, uh, 1960s, 1960s. And um, Smithdown Lane is running along here. And there's Ramsbottom's chimney. I believe it was knocked down somewhere between 1969 to 1971. I can't be absolutely precise. But so this picture was up until maybe 69. And uh, there are a whole series of openings here in the cutting, uh, which I can't quite make sense of, uh, because I, I'm not at all sure that these are roads crossing over. Uh, something's going on here. Maybe somebody else knows better, but I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. But um, up there on the uh, on the skyline, you can see Paddington Gardens, the tenement blocks that were uh, almost built on top of our Paddington cellars there. And then alongside, you can see the Tower of St. Mary's Church. So uh, Paddington Gardens remained there until uh, 1998. But uh, this is definitely sometime in the 1960s. And uh, I'm going to finish off here with um, this rather lovely photograph. Um, this was included in um, uh, Jan Ford's blog. Um, she'd obviously researched this as well, and I found it interesting. So I, I've included it here. This is a photograph uh, taken in the Edge Hill cutting. This train is pulling its way up from Lime Street up to Edge Hill. And I can tell you that this is a photograph taken by a rather famous uh, railway photographer by the name of Eric Treacy. Some of you may know of him. And um, another rather nice little coincidence is that Eric Treacy, as well as being a railway photographer who traveled all over the country um, photographing the railways, he was also a clergyman. And in fact, for five years between 1936 and 1940, he was the vicar of Edge Hill. So he was the, the local vicar of St. Mary's Church in Edge Hill. And this photograph must have been taken literally just no more than a few hundred yards away from his own church. He eventually uh, left Liverpool and went off to uh, become a chaplain. Uh, during uh, in the in the military during the uh, Second World War, don't know what happened to him after that, but uh, he, he had a, an illustrious um, um, time as a as a rather famous railway photographer. Very evocative uh, shot this one. I love it, and that could be somewhere 
passing right through Williamson's land for all I know. Uh, I can't identify exactly where it is. But that's that's about it. That's how the story of the uh, Edge Hill cutting um, interacts with Joseph Williamson and his um, his land and his tunnels. I mean, I, uh, I forgot something here. I didn't even mention how when they cut out the railway cutting, they cut right through again through the middle of um, Williamson's triple decker tunnel. Only this time they cut through all three levels of it. And uh, they had an enormous job uh, making good because the, I believe the, um, the footings for the railway cutting walls had to go down an extra 10 feet below the track bed of the original tunnel because of Williamson's triple decker tunnel gave them a lot more work than they originally anticipated i'm sure they were cursing joseph williamson and as they opened up the uh, the triple decker tunnel on both sides and could look into it they could see uh, the width of it and uh, they they um they reported that the williamson triple decker was wide enough to to take two lines of rails itself so as big as the original railway tunnel it's quite something anyway that is the story and uh, that's about all I've got to tell you. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for watching. And I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much.